Hello, I'm Willie from the Ozarks, and we're ready for our Lesson 102 in A Course in Miracles workbook for students from the original edition here on March the 12th, 2022. I share God's will for happiness for me. I share God's will for happiness for me. And uh, since I'm inside today, I'm going to put on my uh, magical lenses as... Uh, as uh, Jesus calls these things. Uh, <laughs> I haven't got to the place that I can uh, uh, see it real clearly without them yet. You do not want to suffer. This is, I share God's will for happiness for me. You do not want to suffer. You may think it buys you something and may still believe a little that it buys you what you want. Yet this belief is surely shaken now at least enough to let you question it and to suspect it really makes no sense. It has not gone as yet, but lacks the roots that once secured it tightly to the dark and hidden secret places of your mind. Today we try to loose its weakened hold still further and to realize that pain is purposeless, without a cause and with no power to accomplish anything. It cannot purchase anything at all. It offers nothing and does not exist. And everything you think it offers you is lacking in existence like itself. You have been slave to nothing. Be you free today to join the happy will of God. For several days, we will continue to devote our longer practice periods to exercises planned to help you reach the happiness God's will has placed in you. Here is your home, and here your safety is. Here is your peace, and here there is no fear. Here is salvation. Here is rest at last. Begin the longer practice periods today with this acceptance of God's will for you. I share God's will for happiness for me, and I accept it as my function now. Then seek this function deep within your mind, for it is there, awaiting but your choice. You cannot fail to find it when you learn it is your choice and that you share God's will. You can't, what's it, isn't that a beautiful thought? You cannot fail to find God's will. I share God's will for happiness for me and I accept it as my function now. Then seek this function, this function of happiness. Seek this function deep within your mind for it is there awaiting but your choice. What is it that brings our happiness to us? our choice. You cannot fail to find it when you learn it is your choice and that you share God's will. <laughs> what a wonderful thought, huh? Be happy for your only function here is happiness. Be happy for your only function here is happiness. It's just a choice away. Isn't that something what really beautiful to understand? You have no need to be less loving to God's Son than he whose love created him as loving as himself. Of course, he's attaching our happiness with our seeing of our brothers and sisters, God's Son, um, as has he say it, as loving. You have no need to be less loving to God's Son than he whose love created him as loving as himself. We're starting to see that when we, the way we see our brothers and sisters is the way we see ourselves. When we see them in, a, in the light of love, like God created them and how they are, that we are fulfilling our function and have the fruit of our function, which is happiness. You could, think, could kind of think of it that way, maybe. Besides these hourly five-minute rests, pause for frequently today to tell yourself that you have now accepted happiness as your one function and be sure that you are joining with God's will in doing this. <laughs> Isn't that something? We're joining with God's will when we choose happiness. 
Okay, let's go take a look in our text. Uh, we are ready for chapter 16. And I think we, let's pick up in uh, paragraph 48. I think we stopped at 49. We'll read 48. And then we'll see how far we want to read. Uh, while you're turning there, and that's in chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions, section 6, Specialness and Guilt. And like I said, paragraph 48 is where we'll start. Another one of these Seed Saber Exchange heirloom lettuces that they have is this Ella Kromf, K-R-O-P-F. The Ella Kromf. A little bit, look, look at what it says about it. It's a butterhead, but it's a little small one, about the size of a tennis ball. Donated to Seed Savers Exchange in 2005 by Maynard Kromf, grandson of Amish Mennonites Samuel and Ella May Kromf. They acquired it circa 1930 from a man in Stewartson, Illinois, and it became a family favorite. Tender green softball-sized heads with round leaves and pleasantly sweet flavor. It's a butterhead, and it's a 50 to 60 day uh, plant. So that's the Ella Krumpf uh, butterhead heirloom lettuce from the Seed Savers Exchange. All right, let's go. To, let's read and see what we how far we get along here. We may finish this section here today. It's a couple pages. The special relationship is a strange and unnatural ego device for joining hell and heaven and making them indistinguishable. And the attempt to find the imagined best of both worlds has merely led to fantasies of both and to the inability to perceive either one as it is. The special relationship is the triumph of this confusion. It is a kind of union from which union is excluded and the basis for the attempt at union rests on exclusion. What better example could there be of the ego's maxim, seek and do not find, or seek but do not find? Wild maxim, huh? <laughs> seek but do not find. But he's saying when we follow the ego, which is not the voice for peace, we, we end up... Uh, following that dictate, seek but do not find. Most curious of all is the concept of the self which the ego fosters in the special relationship. This self seeks the relationship to make itself complete. Yet when it finds the special relationship in which it thinks it can accomplish this, it gives itself away and tries to, in quotes, trade itself for the self of another. This is not union, for there is no increase and no extension. Each partner tries to sacrifice the self he does not want for the one he thinks he would prefer. And he feels guilty for the sin of taking and giving nothing of value in return. For how much value can he place upon a self that he would give away to get a better one? Paragraph 50. The better self and that betters in quotes, <laughs> the better self the ego seeks is always one that is more special. And whoever seems to possess a special self is loved, in quotes, for what can be taken from him. Where both partners see the special self in each other, the ego sees a union made in heaven. For neither one will recognize that he has asked for hell. And so he will not interfere with the ego's illusion of heaven, which it offered him to interfere with heaven. Yet if all illusions are of fear, and they can be of nothing else, the illusion of heaven is nothing more than an attractive, and that's in quotes, an attractive form of fear in which the guilt is buried deep and rises in the form of, in quotes, love. Of course, he's putting these all in quotes, the word attractive and love and heaven, because, did he put the word heaven in quotes? But anyway, it's the, the I think he did, maybe not. 
but it's the, oh, better, the word better was in quotes, and the word loved was in quote. Because all these things, it's not really better to follow the ego's way. It's not really loving to follow the ego's way. It's not really more attractive, but it seems to when you're upside down uh, appearing, <laughs> when you're looking at things from the ego perspective, which is opposite from the ways of, of God or from the ways of truth. The, Paragraph 51, the appeal of hell lies, lies only in the terrible attraction of guilt which the ego holds out to those who place their faith in littleness. The conviction of littleness lies in every special relationship, for only the deprived could value specialness. The demand for specialness and the perception of the giving of specialness as an act of love would make love hateful. And the real purpose of the special relationship in strict accordance with the ego's goals is to destroy reality and substitute illusion. For the ego is itself an illusion and only illusions can be the witnesses to its, in quotes, reality. Because <laughs> it's not reality. Paragraph 52. If you perceive the special relationship as a triumph over God, would you want it? Let us not think of its fearful nature, nor of the guilt it must entail, nor of the sadness and the loneliness. For these are the only attributes of the whole religion of the separation and of the total context in which it is the thought which it is thought to occur. He's calling it the religion of separation. I used to call it the guilt religion. But you know what? The religion of the, 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 we could call it the religion of separation instead of the religion of uh, union, of oneness. Uh, you know that word yoga means union. So you could the the, the religion of yoga <laughs> that might not go over so well with a lot of people. But uh, it's the idea that we're all united, and that's that's the the common recurring theme in many of the mystical pathways that have been around for thousands of years. But we, 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 we're we starting to learn we don't need to go through the idea that we're all separate. We can understand that we're all united in God and always have been and always will be. The question is, is when we're going to be aware of it or not? So uh, let's start back in 51. The appeal of hell lies only in the terrible attraction of guilt, which the ego holds out to those who place their faith in littleness. The conviction of littleness lies in every special relationship for only the deprived could value specialness. The demand for specialness and the perception of the giving of specialness as an act of love would make love hateful. And the real purpose of the special relationship in strict accordance with the ego's goals is to destroy reality and substitute illusion. For the ego is itself an illusion, and only illusions can be the witnesses to its, in quotes, reality. If you perceive, paragraph 52, if you perceive the special relationship as a triumph over God, would you want it? Let us not think of its fearful nature, nor of the guilt it must entail, nor of the sadness and of the loneliness. For these are the only attributes of the whole religion of the separation, and of the total context in which it is thought to occur. The central theme in its litany to sacrifice is that God must die so you can live. And it is this theme which is acted out in the special relationship. Through the death of yourself, you think you can attack another self and snatch it from the other to replace the self which you despise. And you despise it because you do not think it offers the specialness which you demand. And having it, you have made it little and unworthy because you are afraid of it. How can you grant unlimited power to what you think you have attacked? So fearful has the truth become to you that unless it is weak and little and unworthy of value, you would not dare to look upon it. You think it is safer to endow the little self which you have made with power, you rested from truth, triumphing over it and leaving it helpless. See how exactly is this ritual enacted in the special relationship? An altar is erected in between 
two separate people on which each seeks to kill himself on his body. An altar is erected in between two separate people on which each seeks to kill himself and on his body raise another self which takes its power from his death. Over and over and over this ritual is enacted. And it is never completed, nor ever will be completed, for the ritual of completion cannot complete, and life arises not from death, nor heaven from hell. Whenever any form of special relationship tempts you to seek for love and ritual, remember love is content and not form of any kind. The special relationship is a ritual of form aimed at the raising of the form to take the place of God at the expense of content. There is no meaning in the form, and there will never be. The special relationship must be recognized for what it is, a senseless ritual in which strength is extracted from the death of God and invested in his killer as the sign that form has triumphed over content and love has lost its meaning. Would you want this to be possible, even apart from its evident impossibility? <laughs> For if it were possible, you would have made yourself helpless. God is not angry. He merely could not let this happen. You cannot change his mind. 55. No rituals that you have set up in which the dance of death delights you can bring death to the eternal nor can your chosen substitute for the wholeness of God have any influence at all upon it. See in the special relationship nothing more than a meaningless attempt to raise other gods before him and by worshiping them to obscure their tininess and his greatness. In the name of your completion, you do not want this. In the name of your completion, you do not want this. For every idol which you raise to place before him stands before you in place of what you are. 56. Salvation lies in the simple fact that illusions are not fearful because they are not true. Salvation lies in the simple fact that illusions are not fearful because they are not true. They but seem to be fearful to the extent to which you fail to recognize them for what they are and you will fail to do this to the extent to which you want them to be true. And to the same extent you are denying truth, and so are making yourself unable to make the simple choice between truth and illusion, God and fantasy. Remember this, and you will have no difficulty in perceiving the decision as just what it is and nothing more. 57. The core of the separation delusion lies simply in the fantasy of destruction of love's meaning. The core of the separation delusion lies simply in the fantasy of destruction of love's meaning. And unless love's meaning is restored to you, you cannot know yourself. Who shares its meaning? It's because you're a love being. Separation is only the decision not to know yourself. Its whole thought system is a carefully contrived learning experience designed to lead away from truth and into fantasy. Yet for every learning that would hurt you, God offers you correction and complete escape from all its consequences. The decision whether or not to listen to this course and follow it is but the choice between truth and illusion. For here is truth separated from illusion and not confused with it at all. The last paragraph, 58. How simple does this choice become when it is perceived as only what it is? For only fantasies made confusion in choosing possible, and they are totally unreal. This year is thus the time to make the easiest decision that ever confronted you, and also the only one, <laughs> the only decision that ever confronted you, and also the easiest. You will cross the bridge into reality simply because you will recognize that God is on the other side and nothing at all is here. It is impossible not to make the natural decision as this is realized. 
All right, so really the, every choice is a choice between um, God and nothing or reality and illusion, peace or the loss of peace, thinking that it's going to give you something that you want. Okay, so today, be sure to do your beginning of every hour for five minutes. I share God's will for happiness for me. And I accept it as my function now. Be sure to tell yourself that. And between those hourly uh, pauses, if you can take five minutes, do so. If you can't take five minutes, at least bring your mind to the idea. I share God's will for happiness for me. And I accept it as my function now. And, of course, think about that all through the through the day. We're really trying to stabilize this concept in our minds that um, our, our uh, natural abiding uh, place in life is happiness. And you can determine whether or not you're following God's will based on look in the mirror and see how, how much the Son of God is smiling. <laughs> All right. I, I share God's will for happiness for me. And I accept it as my function now. I share God's will for happiness for me. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Until tomorrow, I share God's will for happiness for me.